So welcome to everybody today. We're glad to have you both with us. Um, and perhaps a very, very quick introduction before we ask some questions and talk about um, you know, retail, people, alumni, and, and all those exciting things that people are interested to hear about. Um, George, George McDonald, we're delighted to have him with us here today. He's the executive editor of Retail Week. And boy, does he know retail. I was just saying to him that I was having a little read and I saw that he joined and first worked on the title in 1998, originally starting as a reporter um, and covers sectors ranging from food to department stores. Um, he's in day-to-day -day charge of Retail Week, um, writes a city column and blogs and has interviewed many of the biggest names in retail over the years. So really keen to hear his views on what's happening in retail, what's happening um, with staffing challenges and get his response to the employee experience um, that Marks and Spencer's or when Vic will be talking about today. Uh, Victoria Mackenzie Gould, who previously worked in uh, Tesco's, initially as a government affairs manager, then group government relations director. I know that she was at number 10 as a special advisor to a former prime minister. Um, and is now the head of comms at Marks and Spencers. We're really glad to have you both today. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. So I would love to just kick off with a very general question about the journey about people. Vic, maybe I'll ask you to just start off with commenting. You know, how and why did thinking about alumni hit your radar and turn into what is, has become a very successful alumni programme? Where did this begin? I think if I'm honest, when I came into this role, which was three years ago this week, as I know, as LinkedIn told me to remind me, um, one of the big pull factors for me and one of the things that was clearly really important to our chairman and our CEO was um, really engaging our colleagues. Um, for me, that's the most important thing I can do in my job because, you know, great colleagues probably means great customer service, great products and therefore more customers. Um, and so for me, the brief was very much around, yes, of course, you need to do all the other bits of your job, but actually changing our culture and really engaging our colleagues is, is probably one of the big things we'd ask you to, to help us do. And actually, um, I know you know Archie, our chairman. So I think, firstly, it's been a massive focus for our business. I mean, look, retail is a massive employer, and obviously George can talk about this in a broader way than I can, but obviously I've worked for Tesco, which is the UK's biggest employer aside from the NHS, and m &S, which employs 70,000 people. So it is a people business. And with that many people, you've obviously got a lot of churn, just even if it's very low turnover, and our turnover is pretty low, but by sheer default, the numbers are actually quite big. And you spend an absolute fortune on recruiting people um, and then trying to retain them in different ways, you know, whether that's we offer some, a really great benefits package and some of that stuff you probably know about, like a discount on all of our products. But then some of it isn't. It's stuff we invest in, like a virtual GP, you know, mental health support. So you spend a lot of money trying to keep your colleagues content. And then obviously for m and and for a lot of businesses in the UK, and look, I know more about this from talking to you, actually, you then just go, OK, see you later, bye. And actually, if you say, OK, see you later, bye, probably depends on whether your manager's in that day, if you're in a store or whatever. So you could actually just leave. And so why wouldn't you try and look after those people? And I think the other thing is at M&S, and you can see and you know, because you've talked about it, colleagues are so passionate about our business and they stay passionate. And there are hundreds of groups on Facebook on LinkedIn around, you know, I worked at Baker Street or I worked at Marble Arch or I worked at Lincoln Store. And so there was this whole group of people really still care about the business and the brand that we just weren't talking to at all. So it felt like probably after we'd started, I hope to make an impact on our current colleagues. I think there's still a lot more to do. Actually, we should probably be thinking about why we're letting these guys just walk out the door um, when we pride ourselves on being a really personable business, you know, and then never talking to them again, which just seems nuts. Yeah, I mean, thanks by doesn't make sense whether you're a law firm, whether you're an international facilities manager company, just the concept of thanks by, uh, it doesn't make sense at all. And I mean, if I was to turn to George, um, on the one hand, I was about to say no pressure, but is M&S an, an anomaly? But actually, that's not really my question and not terribly fair. I was going to say, does this sound like the world of retail you know? Does this sound like the world of customer service you know? Because we were talking just before this started, and when I worked at Boots Walgreens at 16, no one welcomed me, no one said goodbye to me, no one gave me discounts when I was there. They certainly didn't give me discounts after I left. I never heard from them again. And, and really, I can't think of anybody 
and it, I can't think of any employer I had between the ages of 16 and 22, and I had plenty in the, the retail space in particular, where this took place. Is this something new? Is this something you're seeing? Is that sort of interest in employee experience a very new thing, or is this something that you're seeing more widely in retail? Um, I think it's something that's um, certainly been developing over the last uh, few years um, because for a variety of reasons, um, you know, staff have become ever more important. They were always obviously the face of the business in retail um, and the industry has really changed rapidly over the last uh, 10 or 15 years as things like e-commerce has grown and it has had to attract a different um, type of, of person and the retailers are in competition with all sorts of other businesses, you know, banks, um, travel firms who all want that same expertise. Uh, and therefore, it's really important for the retail industry and for retailers to um, really uh, put their people right at the forefront of things, you know. Retail is full of stories um, about people moving from the shop floor to the boardroom um, and that's probably changing now. It's not, you know, it's also famous for big colourful characters who uh, whose word went, whose word was law, whereas uh, again these days um, because of, of changes in the wider world I, I think it's a little bit more collegiate. Obviously it needs to, business needs to move in the same direction, everyone needs to buy in but the sheer um variety uh, breadth of skills that are called upon I mean i think the conversations are different i do think you know companies like m s um are have an advantage because uh you know they are institutions um and they've got a track record even if they um have gone a bit off course at times they've got a track record for uh, you know, treating people well, for doing new things, for being right at the forefront of uh, the, the latest thinking in engaging staff and therefore attracting the best. And, you know, for, for a while it had lost its way um, and as part of that it lost lots of people. Um, but it's interesting, you know, when I would say it started its turnaround, although then it, it took quite a few steps back, it was actually an alumnus, it was Stuart Rose who'd worked there before, who was called back to um, save it from you know, the grasp of, of Sir Philip Green. And you mentioned Archie a moment ago, and you look back at his uh, turnaround of Asda, that was a really good example of where people were at the absolute heart of it. You know, culture is, is a bit of a woolly word in lots of ways, mm. but the culture that he instilled at Asda and the expectations, the shared expectations, the shared sense of purpose, really putting people at the front of things was one of the, uh, one of the uh, initiatives that he took that made a really fundamental difference. I mean, genius. Someone was clearly about to tell me you're on mute. I thought it was clever for me to turn it off whilst you were talking. A terrible idea, both. Um, thank you for that. I know, you know we talk about staff being important and putting staff at the front of everything. And I think every, again, you know, every business needs to take that approach if they're not. But a question um, first for Vic and then, you know, George, I'd love your perspective. I know that for retailers, you employ so many different types of people. You have shop floor staff, you have head office staff, you have staff in warehouses, many of whom used to work in different locations and have different interests, different wants, different needs. Um, how do businesses pull together and engage so many different types of employees? Um, perhaps Vic, start with you and then George, maybe like some feedback because you know retail is many things we talk about retail and we think about a shop front or a supermarket but actually especially with the pandemic we've got layers of tech staff we've got layers of delivery staff welcome your view victoria on that i think there's a couple of ways i'd answer it and i think the first is you've got to know what you stand for so um i'll reflect on some of the language you've used that is verboten at mns so we call everyone a colleague uh you know the word staff is you know, someone can be my staff, but 
I can't be yours if I'm your boss, if you see what I mean. So we're really clear that it's a source of strength, actually. So it means what we stand for is kind of equality. Everyone's a colleague. This head office is absolutely not a head office, it's a support centre. You know, we exist to support the commercial operations, the majority of which is still in stores. And obviously that is shifting. But actually, well, actually, we're then the support centre for Donington, which is our distribution centre, indeed, for dot com and our online operations. So part of it is by flipping that on its head and saying, actually, we want to create a sense of something bigger and a family and therefore we want to hire people who want to feel like that so you know if, if you think actually you're not interested in people who work in stores you probably go and work somewhere else because actually you know you will I've just actually watched I think we're sharing it on our external channels about the, the team that make our good move brand which is actually I think it's the number one women's athletic full price brand in the UK and the people that I know, sorry, plug it, it's a great brand. And I, in mm -hmm. fact, I did then order after watching it a pair of our new What is it? Oh, this is fitness it's, stuff. Oh, yes, I've yes, seen it. Fantastic. Yes, got it. But in this kind of short creative that we're trying to explain, this is who makes it. Actually, we've got people from our technical team, you know, all the way from our buyers, all the way up to the guys who are selling it. And we've got this fantastic woman who works in one of our stores in, in Southwest London. And she's by far the most engaging person, which doesn't mean the other guys aren't great, but actually the way she's talking about the brand and how she sells it. And the point we're trying to make is nothing works without all of those people. So I think there's a real source of strength in it. The flip side is that, as George said, retail's going through an absolute transformation and so is M&S. And actually the last few years have really sped that up. And, and the good thing is it actually means that our some of our colleagues in stores or whatever, who may have actually been a little bit less um, comfortable thinking digital stuff isn't for me now I actually really get it as like actually a customer of ours and probably of other other organizations so there is a big shift in terms of it is a cultural shift across I think not just retail but everywhere but probably particularly Keeney felt in retail where actually you're, you're trying to um, not just you know grow your online business it's more than that you need everyone to become more digital the thing I've just talked about is we're sharing it internally and externally for all of our colleagues and it's digital you know it's not a meeting um, and so we need everyone in the organization to feel comfortable using digital um, tools and skills. So th there is a transition period and there are different audiences based on that. And actually, when we're trying to recruit our data analytical people, and you know, we've launched, I think, the first data apprenticeship in the UK in UK retail, you're trying to cr recruit a different audience than perhaps would automatically think of MS because we've been around since 1884. And that does make it more complex um, because you need to have an employer brand that stretches across everyone. And so that core that we're all in it together is really important. And then you do need to be able to differentiate so that you can get like the best store teams for the store opening and Stevenage, but also the best data analytics people who are probably thinking more actually not about us, but about, you know, if not online retailers and startups and, you know, organizations like yours. And that's a really interesting point, maybe one for George, you know being a, a brand that everybody knows, and certainly in the UK, Middle East, India, everyone knows Marks and Spencers. George, I, I suppose retailers, and you've got a, a quarter of a, of a century of experience to say this, retail, retailers get known for something. I mean, I still think about, I want to go here for X and there for Y, even though it's not necessarily uh, correct, right? I might not think to go to Marks and Spencers, for my sports kit but perhaps they have the best sports kit in the market but i do think about what i did with my grandparents and where i used to buy my food with them um is that something that you see typically there's a sort of um are we attached to brands history or are brands able to sort of shift our understanding um of what they're about and what their and what their relationship is with people um yeah i think they can um change that relationship but I think it, any change needs to uh, you know be an evolution from what they were famous for um, and if you ever uh, you know forget or mess up what you were famous for at any stage that's where it becomes um, becomes difficult uh, but I think um, you know what Vic was saying a moment ago I would agree with a lot of that you know I think to engage uh, people to get them to want to work for you or come and work for you again you really need a, a sort of culture of respect which is becoming ever more important in all, all types of businesses so I think um, 
it's a mindset change partly uh you know Stuart Rose used to say uh one of his little mottos was was look out the window and that really applies right across everything I think in retail because you know are you selling the sorts of things that the people walking past are carrying in their bags or using but equally do is, is your does your business look like that world outside? You know, does it have the sort of diversity within it that people now regard um, as uh, normal? Um, you know, does it uh, get you know, a lot of retailers, for instance, will have mental health programs at the moment because, you know, that's a, an area of concern and it's an area where there's high demand from staff or services and that sort of thing. So you need to have that culture of respect. And then to go back to your point, you need that sense of purpose. So what is a company for? Um, you know, could be all sorts of things to provide great value, great quality food. That might be its commercial purpose. But drawing into that, um, you've probably got bigger purposes that the people within that company identify behind and a company like M&S or John Lewis um, both would be e examples of that. And George I'm going to ask a sort of follow-on question about retail then we're going to drill Vic on some realities of, of, of alumni. Um, you know George you, you talk about brand and we um, and we talk about um, how people perceive retailers and, and and in fact anything where we might spend our money celebrities are often used to advertise brands I mean do you think that obviously I believe that alumni are, are, are a marketing army we, we all know that the opinion of everybody matters but but to the extent that alumni are genuinely able to impact how consumers how pedestrians see a brand I mean is that something that you see in the future? Because I, I guess, you know, we think of some of our retail customers who we know truly care about their people. And this is very much at the heart of, uh, of their employee experience. Is that a direction that even if retailers might be resistant a little bit, they have to adopt? What's your view on that? Yeah, I, yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, it's often said word of mouth is the, the most powerful form of marketing. Uh, and, you know, I think that applies when you're talking about places to work as well as products. You know, if people, um, you know, if they've got fond memories of a business, uh, they've enjoyed their time there, you know, even if they've left, they remain advocates. Um, they, they're sort of goodwill um, remains too and that sort of word of mouth now you know the, can be spread in all sorts of different ways you know people are constantly on social media etc you talk about influencers but actually um, everyone is an influencer in your in different ways um, and so yes. if you want to know what a company's like you're probably going to ask someone who works there or has worked there um, so yes I do think um, I do think that, uh, you know, what you were saying rings true. Yeah, I just don't know how it's avoidable. And it's just really, it's, you know, it's been, it's been a real pleasure and dream watching MNS do this, because of course, for those that are not in the United Kingdom or Europe or sort of to the right side of the world, it is a brand that you would be, it's, it's a retailer, you just would be hard pressed to live anywhere and not know about it and, and not feel warm and fuzzy about it. And it's just fascinating reading the alumni stories, because you've got the people that are on the board of Twitter and Chanel and, uh, you know, Ocado running businesses uh, who used to work for you. And then you've got people on television as TV stars who used to work in your stores. Uh, the Dancing with the Stars uh, equivalent that we have here. I saw that one of the uh, people who almost got to the final and had an injury, she used to work in one of your stores up north. Um, it's just, um, you know, it, it, it really... It's hard to believe you ever didn't keep in touch. Um, Vic, how did Marks and Spencers decide where alumni should sit? Because I know there are lots of people on the line who are making those sorts of decisions. You know, is it HR? Is it marketing? Is it at the office of the chairman? And I know, of course, at Marks and Spencers, your chairman, Archie Norman, has an interest in this. I mean, these are personal decisions based on what it is that you're most aiming to achieve first off with alumni, because as many, you can't do it all at once. How did you make the decision? How is it that we're speaking to you, for example, and not the head of HR? I think partly, um, it, in one sense, you could say it doesn't matter. I think what you need is 
you have to approach this in a way that I think you would approach building a, a channel. I think it does depend on the individual. So there's people who do my job in a very different way. Um, I'm personally very engaged in terms of our culture and our colleagues. And um, I just had to spend time doing my 360 feedback this morning, actually, and that comes through. So I, I think it's actually partly because you see someone who's passionate about it and you think can go and probably quickly do something because what you really need to do this is the ability to work with all different bits of the business to try and error different things um, you have to know lots of people in the business I mean I spent and you know I spent a lot of my time figuring out who knows who and how can we build this community because it's quite hard work to begin with you have to put in a lot of hours and I spent probably more time than was healthy on LinkedIn um, so I think for us why it it sits with us and I think it makes sense is also because there's two elements to employee experience one is what and your employer brand one is how you project internally and externally so I look after colleague communications this is actually just a move forward from that this is communicating to our colleagues who don't work for us anymore so there's a simplistic logic but actually therefore we run our channels, so we know how to run a channel. We've got digital communication experience. We know what makes a good story. Um, and we already work very closely with the HR team on things like LinkedIn and actually are taking a bigger role on that as it becomes a broader kind of news channel. And actually, uh, you know, LinkedIn themselves are very keen to say it's, it's not a careers place. It's actually actually the biggest professional network, social media network in the world. So. It made sense because of how we're structured, I think, because if you're looking after what we get, how we engage our colleagues when they're with us, why wouldn't you look after it when they're not with us? And the personal interest. Um, so knowing that it would be something that you have to have someone who's going to care about it because it's just quite hard work to begin with. And you've got to be able to go up and go down. Um, but whoever it is has to be able to work with all different bits of the business. So, you know, we, of course, we work with HR. I've got some great stats about job applicants and, you know, how many are then going on to get jobs. So, you know, we work closely with HR. You've had good success with that? You're really good success <laughs> with that. So I checked the stats this morning and we, we've really been live for just under a year properly. And we've had 357 applicants. Um, and I think only in the last three months, we've had 11 successful job applicants. So, you know, that's not a bad shout. And I think those numbers actually have doubled in this year rather than calendar year rather than last calendar year. And as the community grows and gets more established, of course, those things grow and get more established. So, you know, of course, we work closely with our HR colleagues and they can really see the value. We're also in the early stages of actually giving our alumni special Sparks offers. And our Sparks oh. is a digital card, which is how we will reward regular shoppers and customers of ours. So that's in the early days. Um, what do you look at so actually, for everybody? It's just a you know. I obviously know right, I have it's a loyalty. It on my phone. It's a loyalty, it's a loyalty and personalization. Exactly, and I go shopping. I finish and I pay. And I open up my app and in comes uh, the barcode and I accrue points. And I think what I mostly use them for is, is I get sort of money off things that I'm already shopping, or in fact actual items that, that sort of you you're promoting that are, are sort of gifts. So that's really interesting. So how are you winding? alumni into that are they getting because they do they already get something when they sign up have you sometimes retailers offer swag is there is there marks and spencer swag we did a percy pig coaster and for anyone who's again doesn't know percy pig you're thinking what on earth are you talking about um it's it's it started life as a sweet percy did and now he's a bit more than a sweet but he's a much loved character um so we've done that and then um we're developing what we're going to do in terms of Sparks, but the whole point of Sparks is how can we offer personalised offers? And obviously what we know is our alumni are very committed people. They they want to support the brand. That's why they've joined the alumni network. So actually, you know, how can we reward that? Um, how can we see, you know, what, what they think is good? Because what are they buying? Um, and then the other thing that we want to try and do is actually how can we use them potentially as mentors? So, you know, that's also a pool of people. And as you've just said, you know, we've got some very senior alumni. We've also got alumni who, you know, joined because they worked in the same store for 25 years and, and their family worked there too. So we've got a really diverse skill set. Um, so I think you, you need people to approach it in a way that isn't dictated to by where they work. Uh, by default, when you work in a comms function, uh, particularly, I think, in a business where comms is important and, you know, m is a, very high level brand and, and we've got lots of colleagues so it matters 
actually it's a good skill set because you have to be able to work across multiple disciplines multiple teams bring things together in a way that's coherent um and you should be creative hopefully so it's it it, it works well for us um but i think wherever it sits in the organization what really matters is being able to work with all different parts of the organization to to give a great offer to your alumni and um, but also to make sure the business gets the best return on it yeah, thank you. Fascinating. And um, for those who don't know Percy Pig and what that candy is, I'm sure there'll be people Googling afterwards and uh, we'll be distributing some around the world. George, I'd love to ask you, you know, to weave you into this, when you think about um, relationships with people and, and, and Vip was talking about you know, loyalty cards, uh, perks when you sign up, you know, we've got banks who sent out, you know, they don't send out candy, but last, last year, Rothschild, the investment bank, M&A, you know, very uh, financially focused, sent out gift boxes. It was a spring gift box with seeds and bulbs and all sorts of things to plant in the garden for the spring year. Lots of businesses offer something when you when you sign up. And in that way that the rewards and perks sometimes matter to shoppers. Do you, do you think that it matters to people when they're thinking about going to work somewhere? Do you think anyone might be impacted by that? I am a person who voraciously collects points. Uh, and anybody that knows me well will know that, um, you know, they provided me with a lifetime of things that I couldn't necessarily have afforded or a or a, a sort of, you know, a holiday on the books. Fantastic. Do those actually matter to people working in retailers? George, infamous Zoom phrase from the pandemic, you are on mute. Yeah. Yes, uh, I think, uh, you know, they, they can make a difference. Um, I don't think um, the, the gifts like points and things, I personally don't think that's going to be, uh, you know, th that in itself will seal the deal. Uh, I think people look at, um, you know, the, the sort of reward package in a, in a more rounded way. So, you know, they want uh, fundamentally a good wage and at the moment uh, you know it's good and bad at the same time you've got massive wage inflation going on in, in retail which you know it shows how important the, the reason for that is because it's difficult to get people which again brings us back to this point I guess is at the center of things about attracting retaining and drawing back um, the best people so I think they look at the whole um, package that's on offer uh, and you know things like staff discounts um you know th those make a difference those are that's a real benefit um but they will also look at yeah what sort of place is it to work and that could be could involve anything you know depending on their what they're like as people it could be oh what you know what does that store do for good causes uh, you know that can be something that people really buy into or it can be uh, you know the, the the sort of culture of innovation or, or something like that um, so yeah I don't I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all but it's got to be you know uh, in material terms a decent package um, or, or you're on yeah. to lose you know over here the the, the value grocers people like um, Aldi you know they pay high they're up there with the best of them uh, in terms of what they pay. So it's by no means, um, <clears throat> you know, it, you have to have a good rounded rewards package. No one's going to go just for a few extra points on a, a loyalty scheme. Yeah, probably I would have done, but I'm the anomaly. Um, Vic, <laughs> you know, a really interesting fact um, that I can tell you is up to 50% of visitors to alumni networks, and I'm speaking broadly across all our customers, um, are people thinking of going to work for that particular company? And it ties on to what George is saying. It's not one thing, but it's important. What kind of place, uh, what kind of company is this? Do you want to build a lifetime, lifetime relationship with them or are people disposable? What kind of place is it to work, essentially? Um, I always say you want to tell people we're a great place to be, but we're also a great place to be from. Um, how does this feed into, you know, I, I know obviously your um, alumni are customers, their friends and family are customers. And really on the one hand, it's customer service. You're giving them the same customer experience that you'd want to give me or George, even though we didn't work for you. And then there's the employee experience side, which is treat people well. To, to what extent, um, you know, do Marks and Spencer have the opportunity because something George and I touched on recently when we caught up 
is Marks and Spencers does have this incredible history of being a family-esque place to work. I mean, I have an uncle that worked there. A friend of mine had 11 members of his family when I spoke to him uh, who worked there. He and his ex he and his wife worked there. Their mother worked there. Their sister-in-law. I mean, is is MS special in that respect, or do you think that that's weaved in that that's weaved in elsewhere? So we've called the alumni network MS family then now and always, which may sound a bit schmaltzy. But we actually asked, so we set up a founders panel because there are so many groups already set up from colleagues who used to work together who wanted to do it themselves. And I don't know of anywhere else that could do that and then wouldn't kind of get pilloried a little bit. You know, there'd be an element of QI role or however you'd want to say it. And it's obviously difficult because I'm not objective. I'm, I'm on the payroll. Um, it very much does have that feel um, and it has that feel everywhere, actually. Um, you know, I mean, look, I was working in store over Christmas. I was working Chestnut store and doing the um, Christmas food to order desk, which I love doing. And I was working with two families, you know, two sets of mums and daughters. And then there was actually when you're talking, well, I know the store quite well and there's quite a few families that work there. So that's definitely a statistical fact that we do have lots of families that work for us, but it's not just that, it's a feeling. And I think we felt a really high level of confidence, partly yes, because you know we have always treated people well, but I think where you really saw that was obviously in the last two years. And you know, some of actually what Steve, who's our CEO, was talking to our colleagues about, we shared externally. And much we didn't just because, you know, and, you know, he talked about us being a family, but comes back to what I said at the start, you can only say that if it's the real experience of colleagues. So, you know, we took decisions that, you know, in 20, but it feels like a million miles away now, but, you know, 2020, 21, you know, like all businesses, we were looking at our balance sheet and, you know, preparing for not knowing what the future held in terms of trade and, Despite that, you know, we made two decisions, which is that no one would get a bonus, um, which means, you know, salaried people who are pretty well paid. And secondly, that all of our frontline colleagues who are working will get a 15 percent bonus. Wow. And, you know, we made sure and, and these feel like easy decisions now, but like everyone who, who needed to be um, shielding that, you know, we top up what the government was paying so that people didn't lose out. And I can honestly say that those decisions, and it comes back to what I said at the start about the chairman and the CEO genuinely care about our people. Uh, so do the wider leadership team, actually. And therefore, you can say that because I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but it's not bullshit. If it's bullshit, you can't say it because it'll you'll smell it. Yeah, um, this is not children's TV, by the way, so we won't hold that okay. against you. Okay, and it's not a bad one. Um, but also, you know, the great thing about, you know, alumni is a social channel. Well, there's lots of other social channels. So if you start saying things that don't sound right, people will just say it. Uh, so I think it's one of the reasons people do work. It's one of the reasons, you know, I stay. It's, you know, people come to it for different reasons, but it, it does feel like, you know, more than a transactional place of work. And actually, you know, we serve 32 million customers in the UK that's most of the population. That feeling of family is also about the feeling we want to project to our customers who are families, you know, we're the biggest school uniform um, seller in the UK, you know, we're the biggest bra seller. Um, we're there for people at different stages of their lives, you know, at key moments, you know, our baby wearing ourselves hugely. Um, our athleisure range is massive, but you know, we're there for everyone, actually. And so, actually, we should be there for all of our colleagues. Otherwise, I, I think that experience and, and, you know, it's also a competitive marketplace. So we need to stand for something because otherwise people just go somewhere else and, and get something that's a bit cheaper. It's, it's part of that value proposition as well, I think. Thank you. Um, we've got lots of questions here that I'm getting privately on DMs and in the Q&A. So I'm going to start taking some of the uh, questions. I don't know everybody and forgive me who's asked a question by name, although there's some anonymous. Uh, and I can guess who some of the anonymous people are. Uh, we'll start off with one for George. George, how can an alumni network influence brand value? Now, of course, you uh, are not in the business of alumni, um, and you're certainly uh, not in the business of enterprise alumni, but I guess you know, the question becomes, you know, how does maintaining an, a relationship potentially raise brand value? That comes from somebody, um, that comes from Jana, who is uh, from the 6453 alumni network, which is Nike. Right, um, so I guess, um... 
brand value may mean different things to different people but one so i'm thinking here of the the business brand the the employer brand um and that sort of shines through to the the consumer i think um i'd say one of the big things alumni do is um keep you honest you know they remember they will remember the business at its very best uh, and they will um, as uh, you know, to borrow Vic's phrase, they can smell the BS too. And so they will, you know, they'll tell it like it is. And that's uh, an incredibly um, valuable thing. Um, you know, uh, when Vic was talking a moment ago, I was just thinking, um, I spoke to someone for a piece lately um, and it was all about people. And um, they said that uh, one of the questions that's coming up all the time now when they're interviewing people is uh, what did you uh, what did you do during the pandemic? How did you treat your people in the pandemic? And there is no place to hide now. Everything is transparent. Everything is on social media. Um, so people can really quickly tell whether you're being truthful and authentic or not. So to me, that's one of the biggest things that the alumni can, can bring, that real affinity with the values that made a business great. And sometimes when companies lose their way, it's because uh, you know they've lost sight of what was that fundamental appeal and you might need to make it anew again to make it relevant in particular times but it's uh, it's very rare that the foundation there was anything wrong with the foundation stone um so that to me is the biggest thing uh, and then again you know they can be such great advocates because they remember what it was like at its best and therefore what it being great can mean. That's a happy memories, right? Which is kind of what our alumni stories celebrate is those great memories of the things that you loved. And it can be something as, you know, if I think about my memories of the places I spent my career in large businesses, you know, I, I got plenty of ones which I'm not so fond of, but I remember the best of them and the best of the people that I worked with. Um, and uh, thank you very much for that. Um, George, we've got a, a collection of other questions here. Vic, one for you. What tactics, so awareness, communications and marketing, have you found to be the most successful to reach alumni? And obviously you're, so you're, sort of a, year, you're a year into a sort of big reboot of phase two of your alumni programme. So there's lots of learnings underway right now. I guess some early learnings would be helpful. A couple of things. Number one, um, you need to talk to everyone. You need to think about who you want to target first. So the first people we got in touch with the people who've already set up their own networks. We created that founders panel. I think that was a great idea from you. But actually, part of what you want to do is understand, well, what is it you're interested in? What do you want to know? You know, how do you want us to talk to you? Um, I think the second is to get really senior sponsorship. So I had that already in spades. But I think if you don't have that, you should probably get it because you need to engage your current colleagues as well. And then the third was we did a lot of like due diligence on actually which of our senior leaders knows who. So, you know, of our kind of the alumni, um, you know, to add that sparkle, I guess, you know, our, our alumni senior literati. Alumni. I think we're going to exactly. coin that phrase. Alumni exactly. Literati. exactly. And actually our founders panel is much more drawn from people who tend to have worked with us for a long time in, 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 in more store based roles. So actually they're a great gateway into that big group of people. So we kind of segmented the audiences, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And then we did a big media, um, earn media, I should say, approach as well. So, and the other thing I should call out actually is that within your colleague base, you should also look at who your boomerangs are. So we did that on two bases. We did that on our, our kind of top leaders, because quite a few of them are, and we, we kind of gave them the responsibility that you need to get involved in this and, and share. And then obviously the wider boomerang network, which we've got very high numbers of, given that people tend to come back to us even over Christmas and things. Um, and then we coupled that with a bigger media campaign. And look, m &S is a brand that people feel an affinity for. So, and it was the first kind of scale UK retail alumni network. So we had a bit of a story um, and we worked that story pretty hard. And we did that. We actually got mainstream media coverage as well as trade um, and some of the kind of more people-based um, coverage. And then the other thing is when you get people on the site, you've got to keep them there. Otherwise they won't come back. And, and I think took us a while to get that right partly because we, we were developing the resource and right people in the right place but actually you need a content strategy so we then have now got a much clearer content strategy that's um 
very set on when we deliver news and we make sure that that news you can't get elsewhere but we've tried things that haven't quite worked so we've done events for our alumni um, and actually they sharing them on LinkedIn has been a brilliant way of getting people to join but actually participation life has been low on replay a bit higher so we're learning all the time about what we do um, and then of course the key thing is your offboarding so getting in at the right stage on that so that we're now properly in that process and we've seen a massive spike as we've as we've targeted the the kind of people that work with us over the christmas period a uh, thousand people in the last few weeks have joined which is incredible and that's wow. really down wow. to that yeah yeah and we and you know and, and that's not been driven by a big awareness campaign that's been by personal or linkedin right because i mean you just or mentioned LinkedIn. LinkedIn, but you've got loads of people who just simply aren't on linkedin, LinkedIn. Exactly i remember when that. you first launched and you i remember you engaged with that large unofficial group on Facebook and that kind of shot the signups up by 500. So, and I guess it's, again, it's the same for any business, right? Whether you're a law firm, a bank, uh, what, whatever you are, there are pools of people. I still meet the people I worked with in banking once a year for dinner without fail. And there's 20 to 25 of us on a WhatsApp group. And there are certain peaks, peaks and troughs of communication, but we will always still stay in touch. And we were a graduate group that joined at 21 when we knew absolutely nothing and were going nowhere at the time so I think there are you know those unofficial pools of people are probably as important as those social pools of people potentially definitely and just be agile and that's what I mean about a creative mindset it's not just about creative comms it's about thinking like oh we could do that we could do that we could do that and um, I think then the other thing is when you're launching is get a broad brush group of people together and you know I had my kind of um, head of corporate communications, Amanda, who's fantastic and George will know her very well, but actually she's also just very creative. So you wanna just get, and you need some quite senior people to get it going. So, you know, I just get, a, you need strength in numbers and we had lots of creative sessions and that included HR and marketing, but also just a large part of my team. I was like, how can we make this fly um, and, and try new things? But Vic, you know, there was, chairman advocacy there was board advocacy I mean you started off with a bang I think there are lots of people who start on a you know on a shoestring and I think the important thing is to get started right um I think that's right and by the way we didn't spend any money and we didn't have anyone that we hired in to do it other than a grad on secondment for two months so we didn't chuck a lot of money at it but what we did chuck a lot I guess in one sense is you know like my time is probably not cheap so you you need that senior you need a senior person to sponsor the delivery of it which actually yes you need you know chairman support and all that but you need someone who can cut through in the business and say actually look some of it I can't tell you why this matters because we need to figure out what the ROI is going to be but take a step back it probably matters doesn't it so should we have a go yeah and you you know you're an example of a large business that had very senior support day one and asked those questions you know we've got lots of customers that had started with five hours a month of time and just had to sort of start small but these this is why these are important in coming together i've got a question for george it's a bit of toughy and then i've got some sort of very specific questions that have just um, appeared in the, in the chat here that we're going to ask for george I, I don't know the answer to this before i ask you but but vic talked about boomerangs you talked about boomerangs you talked about big personalities that have built businesses are there great examples of people who went back to companies and ran them. I mean, we talked about Marks and Spencers and Stuart Rose. Is that a common theme you see? I mean, uh... um, yeah, you do see it. So uh, one example that's um, ongoing at the moment is uh, Super Dry, which a lot of people will know. Um, Julian Dunkerton, who was the founder, um, left uh, a few years back. He didn't like what then happened and there was a great big uh, battle for, for control and now he's back in charge um, and running it uh, according to his lights. So it certainly does happen. The other thing that happens, it's not boomerang exactly, but you will get groups of people who have worked together at one business who then will stay quite tight and may go and you know work their magic at, at a few. So actually at Marks and Spencer, you've got Archie Norman, who had previously worked with uh, Stuart Makin, um, who has uh, you know been running the food arm and, and now is joint um, COO, isn't it? Vic. Um, so they both worked together in Australia with um, Coles, I think it was. So you have those groups of people who've got to know one another uh, at particular places, and then they may go and 
you know work their magic together again as a as a group or as a, a section of of that group at, at other companies um so yeah um yeah that's yeah, my so answer to that yeah i guess you know you get to know people and you try to pull in the best people you learn, you you met and know about and worked with in your career when you're somewhere new to, to, to which is of course what we, what I've done in my business too um we've got a bunch of questions in 10 minutes left that are some of them are tough ones for Vic um I've got one question here which was really interesting um, and broad and then I've got some very specific ones Vic how is the success of the MS alumni network impacting the broader organization big question I've never known it's you to be before an answer. Yeah, it's I'm a just, great question, I know. right? It's a great question. I, often, I, I know. I, I think my feedback time this morning, I should sometimes pause more. Um, <laughs> I think it's an output of a shift in our culture rather than an input, um, by which I mean the fact that we've focused on it is symptomatic of the fact that we've genuinely started thinking much more about our people. Um, so I think you, know, you, you could talk about kind of business outcomes. And I think the honest answer is it's too soon to say if there's any kind of really incredible business outcomes. Um, you know, they're all the things you'd expect. Um, and, and there's actually been, in, interestingly, I think it's something else about our employer brand that it shows that we're doing things a bit differently. So I think there's a kind of... And digitally, Vic. I mean, I just think about... I mean, you definitely know, that. Definitely that. One of your that. sponsors of this is, is a digital and is your transformation, you know, the, your board member who's responsible for transformation. I mean, when I, I remember when this happened and when I read your press release and I understood what was going on behind the scenes. And this felt, uh, when we were doing some early feedback about the m and Marks and Spencer, we had a lot of feedback about, okay, m and is going digital. Has this been I think me? that's right. And that's kind of what I mean about it being an output as well, in that um, it's a sign of the fact that we're not being, um, you know, kind of, we're, we're, we're being, I think what it is, is that we're not being too uptight, like even calling it the m and family, you can see it's a sign of us being more modern in every way, not just in terms of being digital. And I, and I do think that, you know, what, what was a really positive outcome of, of the pandemic, and obviously lots of not positive ones, was that even our older alumni and indeed our older colleagues actually could see that digital was for them too so the concept that you could connect with people digitally as well as face to face I definitely help people understand that and and probably even you know us you know I'm not young anymore middle age but you know someone who kind of understands digital channels I, I think it really helped us understand from a human connection point that actually there's all these cool things you can do so I think it, it's more symptomatic of how MS is changing as a business. But what it reinforces is that ah, we've got values, we stick to them. You know, we, we um, have had four values for, for some time, and one of them was talk straight. And that was all about, you know, none of this hierarchical w whiffle waffle. Um, and I'm sure George. You're going to swear, swear again, Vic. We're going to have to give you a three times and you're out. No, no, I wasn't going to swear. Talk straight, <laughs> whiffle, exactly. Don't worry. I, I won't get in trouble. <laughs> but also do the right thing. Now, of course, on one level, that what does that mean? It's a nothingy statement. But on the other hand, what it means is actually, we really mean it. It means we want to do right by you. Um, and that's timeless. So I, I think it's an output of how the brand and the business is becoming much more modern and relevant again, but that the things that we stand for remain. So, and that's why it works. Thank you for that. Um, we've got a question here, which I'd like to, to raise and then ask you both to answer from different perspectives. The question is, uh, I was wondering if you exclude anyone or is your network open to all? So I guess Vic, first of all, would love to hear the answer to that. And George, um, from my perspective, I, I'd love to hear something, uh, your views on this. There's an enormously mobile workforce. I guess I was quite a diligent McDonald's employee when I was 16 and I turned up on time and I left on time and I behaved myself, but no doubt, if you're 16 or 17 or 22, a little bit younger, you may not be as responsible as you are when you sort of grow up, so to speak. And probably if you were a naughty 16 year old who got drunk one night and didn't turn up to work the next day and then it never, <clears throat> then never showed up again, perhaps at 26 or at 36 or at 46 or 56, you might be a great recruit. So I'd love Vic to tell us what Marks and Spencers do. And George, I mean, I presume there's a lot of mobility in retail as there used to be. Do you think it makes sense to 
stay in touch with bad leavers? A question for you both. It's open to everyone. Um, that's not without challenges. So getting the content right is 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 quite difficult because you know um, I, I think if you're professional services, then pretty much everyone's on there to also look for their next job. And it, you know, whereas for some of some of the people who are on ours, it's very much simply to reminisce and to kind of hear things about the business. And for others, it's an opportunity to network. And for others, you know, actually they've joined, but they're not that active because they're still very active in their professional careers. Um, but it's open to everyone. Thank you very much for that. And George, I'd love to hear, you know, you deal with so many retailers. Do you see that? Do you see that? Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking I was very responsible. Maybe not everyone's like that when they were 16. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, there's the bad levers and bad levers, aren't there? You know, one person's bad lever might be another hero <laughs> of the shop floor who spoke up on everyone's behalf. Sounds like yeah. terrorist and freedom fighter, George. <laughs> but but, but uh, let's say it's another sort of bad lever um, of, of the sort you were just talking about there, Emma. You know, I imagine that these sorts of networks are if you are sort of self-selecting, you're sort of going to want to go back because you've got good memories. Uh, you know, I think I find it almost impossible to imagine that someone who didn't have a good experience or didn't, you know, wasn't going to join it with goodwill. And if they did, I think, you know, they would probably feel uh, quite un un unwelcome and they they probably wouldn't go back. Uh, I don't. Uh, yeah, I think they're quite self-regulating. That would be my guess. I don't yeah. know. Well, it's interesting because a lot of brands that have had, well, I say brands, might be businesses of any sort that have had a bumpy ride. Maybe lots of acquisitions. People were made redundant. Um, you know, changes in leadership. Actually, alumni is very often a way to kind of bring people back into the fold. Either because why wouldn't you join? Or because there's a perk that makes it compelling enough, or because sort of time has passed. And it's been really interesting watching those, right? Um, mm. Sometimes if a company has bought three brands and it's under a new banner and you identified with name one and it's not still in the title, actually you are still part of the same family. So it's an, in it's an interesting exercise and we're going through it almost as either crisis management or really just sort of getting the brand back on track after a bumpy few years. That's really interesting. Um, what's wrong? I was just going to say, there was one retailer, uh, I won't name them, but a very big retailer that was hugely acquisitive, constantly doing deals, and also was the most political Byzantine organization. Um, and they had a much more informal um, alumni network. Uh, but people from every sort of phase and stage and political camp all came, and they all came with goodwill. So, uh, so maybe um, bygones can be bygones, and, and people's uh, strengths are, are what um, what actually come out in these networks. Uh, well, that is always the plan, isn't it? And, and even if I can guess who that retailer is, I shall keep my uh, mouth firmly zipped on that. Um, Cheryl poses a question here. Cheryl's asking, what does Marks and Spencers actually want to achieve from its alumni network? And I know, Vic, that you shared some statistics about Boomerang success. You talked a little bit about how the, the, the loyalty card you have is being made available to uh, alumni. So presumably they're going to get other perks. Um, love to hear love to hear that and then we've got a very important call in the caterpillar question which for those international guests we're going to have to explain so vic tell us about what you want to achieve and then we're going to have to definitely go on to cake i think there's two things one is we want to create a kind of lifetime relationship with our colleagues like you try and do with customers um and part of that is by enabling them to have the same sense of community and connection as when they were colleagues. So there's something quite altruistic about it. And that's very much about the customer experience. The other is that's a group of people that we haven't tapped into, whether that's as brand, um, fundamentally as brand ambassadors. But if you break that down, that's as literally customers, they probably spend more and certainly probably could spend more. That's as people to recommend jobs, you know, as well as come back to work for us. And, you know, you've got the stats more than me about how that tends to work very well and people tend to stay longer. Um, it, it's also, though, about those, what are those wider things? So at some point, actually, it's a great focus group. So how can we use that group of people to say, look, we're developing this or we're thinking of doing this. What do you think? Um, potentially as mentors. And we have a, a kind of big sustainability program called Plan A that colleagues have always really valued. And, and actually talking of Sparks, 
we make charity donations every time our Sparks customers buy make a purchase. And that is seen by customers as one of the big dif differentiators of, of our kind of digital loyalty scheme versus others. And so that, that sense of wanting to do that is very much alive with our colleague base as well. And so we're also, we, I don't have the answer yet, but we're trying to think about, well, how could we have an offer for our alumni so that they can get involved? So it, we want to genuinely create somewhere that's great for colleagues and for, you know, former colleagues, but also we want to do it in a way that we think brings benefit to the business. And look, there's all the HR stuff, you know, which I talked yes. about at the start. Yes. Well, I mean, important. for Cheryl, for Cheryl, a couple of statistics, and then we'll probably, it's time to sign off. Time flies. Um, for people listening and interested in, um, you know, our statistics, and we can only speak for our platform, up to 40% of applicants um, who apply for jobs for our platform are hired. That's across all the different verticals. There obviously differs between retail, financial services. Up to 16% of total annual company hires are alumni. Um, and 24% of your alumni through the lifetime of being on your platform are likely to apply for a job. That's, you know, obviously we've got some industries where it's enormous and we've got some where it's lower, but that's, you know, those are big numbers. Those are pools of people not to be ignored. And Vic, I hear you talk about, you know, employee experience and customer experience. And there's this point, there's these people in the middle who are both, um, exactly. and what do, we, what do we call them? And one word to call them is alumni, right? They fit into both camps. Um, there are a couple more questions that we've got here that um, we're gonna take note of and um, we'll follow up with. I'm not gonna ask you the hilarious question that was posed by an anonymous, person about Colin the Caterpillar attending our Prime Minister's birthday party during COVID. Um, I saw a great, uh, have I got news for you tweet yesterday, was a picture of Colin that he'd been called as the first witness and the well, for those, investigation. So for, Colin for will remain line, above the fray. Good. And for those on the line, just to let you know, Colin the Caterpillar is an infamous caterpillar cake that uh, anybody that lives in the United Kingdom and probably a lot of the right side of the world uh, loves uh, very, very dearly, who purportedly made an appearance, uh, a, a food related appearance at a party held by our Prime Minister during COVID. You may have seen that in the news. We, um, Colin makes no comment on the topic. Uh, he stays very quiet and firmly independent. Um, George, Vic, uh, loads more things that I'd love to ask you. Ultimately, um, we only have an hour of your time. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll aggregate some other questions and we'll try and get some answers for you uh, from you that we can share with people later. Um, hopefully everybody who's joined has learned something about why and what you're doing as regards alumni. And from George, just the changing a way that people, um, that retailers and employers need to think about their people, uh, lifetime and lifelong relationships and how that can benefit your business. So thank you very much and have a lovely weekend and, and a lovely weekend to all of our guests. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thanks. Lovely to see you, George. See you. Bye.